If you have your Bibles, we're in John chapter 21. John chapter 21, starting with verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he says, you know that I love you. Sister Annette was sharing this with our children. Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my young people. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to delve into your word, to dig a little bit deeper. As we close out this series, Father, the challenge, the challenges we've been receiving every single week, Father, we're asking for them to culminate in a decision that we must make today. You're asking us the question, do we love you? And we hope to give you an answer by the end of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. So we're in the Gospel of John in 21, and uh, this is the third time that Jesus met with his disciples after his resurrection. It is believed that he met with his disciples seven times in total. And it's this experience, it's, it's this experience that John decides he wants to close out, he wants to close out his gospel. Now, at the very end of his gospel, he's very clear. In this, he, he, he tells us that if he could write about all the things that Jesus had done, there wouldn't be enough room in all of the world, in all of the world. So here we find ourselves. Here we find ourselves. John deciding to close out this most magnificent gospel narrative with this story, this story about Simon Peter. The Bible tells us as we look back at chapter 21 that the disciples had been waiting around. They had already seen Jesus. They knew he was resurrected. They knew that there was still a mission and a call on their lives. But the Bible says in verse 3 that Peter says, I'm going out to fish. <laughs> I'm going out to fish. And, and, and a few of his compadres says, we'll go with you. In verse 3, so they went out and got into a boat that night. However, they did not catch anything. Now, some people get on Peter's case because they think that he has returned back to his old profession, that he had given up on following Jesus. But that's not what the text says. It is very likely that the disciples were simply hungry <laughs> and they wanted some morning star veggie fish. And that's the reason why. But I do think it's interesting that John bookends this gospel, especially when you look at the gospel of Mark and Matthew, when Jesus first meets Peter, when he first meets Simon Peter, the first thing he says to him is, follow me. We talked about it at the very beginning of the series. That the first encounter with Peter was Jesus getting into his boat and saying, go out into the waters. And, and Simon says, hey, I, I didn't catch anything. There's no fish out there. I, we're out of luck. And Jesus says, no, 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 cast the net where I tell you to cast the net. And here we find ourselves, here we find ourselves right where we started. Peter, water, fishing. But they didn't catch anything, just like the first time. They didn't catch anything. But then it says early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, and he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, then throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Ooh, that's a word right there. Throw your net on the right side, the right side. See, some of us don't catch what we are hoping to catch because our net is on the wrong side, not the right side. I know he wouldn't try to say right like that. But it, it's, the, it's on the wrong side and not the right side. And this is what's so critical. When Christ 
beckons us to follow him, and he tells us where to cast our net. He tells us where to walk. He tells us what to say. He, he leads us, and we follow. We will find blessings that were not accessible had we simply done it ourselves. The first time Jesus met Simon, he says, yo, we've been doing this all night, and listen, I'm kind of the expert. I'm kind of the expert, and what do we learn that first sermon? Jesus knows more about your profession than you do. <laughs> Jesus knows more about your personal life than you even know about it. Christ knows more about your heart than you do, so that when Jesus speaks, we listen to him. He's a know-it-all, and I'm so grateful he's a know-it-all. So Jesus is calling out. He's, he's yards and yards away from them. Have you caught anything? These disciples, look at this backseat driver from the shore. No! Cast your net on the right side! What is this joker talking about? You don't think that we haven't had the net on the right side and the left side and the front and the back? We haven't caught anything. Mind your business! Trust me! See, when we trust and obey, we will find the results that we are looking for. Many of us are searching. We're not happy. We're not fulfilled. Some of you, you finally have reached the, the, all of your goals. You, you finally professionally are where you have always dreamt to be. Uh, uh, your children are graduated. They've left home. They've, they've given you wonderful grandchildren. Uh, you, you, you reached a certain place of leadership in the church and in your community, and yet, yet you still are not fulfilled. Your bank account is good, and yet you're still not fulfilled. And I'm telling you, a lot of us are casting our net all over the place except for the place that Christ Christ has asked us to cast the net. And what you're not going to understand until you actually experience it, when Jesus tells you to cast your net on the right side, even if you don't end up with as much money in your account, I promise you, you'll be more fulfilled, more happy, more peace, more joy than you had ever experienced in your life. When the rich young ruler left Jesus because he had a lot of money and Christ said, sell everything and follow me, he left because he thought he was going to be losing his value, losing his security. And what he didn't realize is what Christ was offering him was far more valuable than he had in his bank account. He would have far more security than what his money could provide. Jesus asked us to give up because he has something better. And better is not always more. Oftentimes, better is less, and we just don't know that. Cast your net on the right side. Just do it, Pete. Just do it. Come on, man. Let's just let's do it and get out of here. This is an embarrassment. We clearly have lost our touch. So they cast their net on the right side. It says, when they did, verse 6, it says, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. At this point, the disciples were clear on one thing. Only one person we know where fish listen to him like that. So, so Simon Peter knew it was Jesus. And the Bible says that he was naked, which means he's probably just in his undies. But, but he put on his, his clothes and jumped in water. I don't know why he put on his clothes to jump into the water. I feel like it would be a more difficult swim. Maybe he thought he was going to walk on water again. I don't know. But he put on his clothes and he jumped into the water and he swam all the way to the shore. And when he gets there, I imagine him out of breath. <laughs> and Jesus has breakfast ready. Come on. Come on. Where did you get the fish? We just got How did you get fish already? Pete. And so they all sit down and they begin to eat with Jesus. What a beautiful story, right? This bookend, this is how we begin. This is how we are closing out. This is how we're ending. The symmetry is so beautiful. And this is when Jesus, after they had finished eating, this is when Jesus begins to ask Simon Peter these questions. Simon, son of John, 
do you love me? Now, Jesus asked three times, and most ministers and theologians and commentators will tell you that Jesus asked Peter three times because Peter had denied him three times, right? Peter had denied him three times. So, so this, this made sense. He wanted to reinstate Peter. He wanted to reestablish Peter. There was something important that for, in order for Peter to be considered a leader again among the ranks of the disciples, that there needed to be a sense of repentance. Remember what we read last week when we were talking about uh, fail-safes and how we talked about how important it is that, uh, that one, we're, we're good listeners, right? We talked about that. And, and uh, remember Jesus said to him that Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat, but I have what? prayed for you. That was our third failsafe, that Jesus prays for us. So that's why we can trust we're not going to fail. Jesus is praying for us. But one of the things that Jesus says is to, to Peter that was so important, it was prophetic, he says, but when you return, meaning that Peter for a time would drift. Peter would cut himself off. Peter would deny Jesus. He says, but when you return, strengthen your brothers. Right? So the fact that Peter is there in the presence of Jesus signifies that he has returned. This is an act of repentance. Repentance is simply this, turning back. Just turning back. Like, yo, Jesus, you were right, I was wrong, and here I am. This is what makes Peter different than Judas. Not that there was something more special about Peter and something so, so gravely more evil about Judas. What makes them different, the only reason why Judas, again, we, we, we think of him in such, you know, horrific terms, is because Judas never returned. Judas' sin wasn't more unpardonable than Peter's. I would think that Peter's was worse because he was in the inner sanctum. He was one of Jesus' closest disciples and boastfully said, I will never, never forsake you. Not even if all these other guys forsake you. Jesus, I will die for you. And this is what I believe Jesus is referring to when he says, do you love me more than these? Because you, you promised me that you would love me more than the rest of the disciples said they loved me. You said you would love me more. Have, do you love me more? So what makes Peter different than Judas is that he simply returns. The same love and forgiveness that was there for Peter was also there for Judas. And this is why it is so important. No matter how much we have failed, no matter how many times we've stumbled, no matter how, how weak our faith might be, it is so critically important that we return. That's it. Just return. Just come back. And that's why I always tell parents when they, they, they're, they're panicking, oh, pastor, my, my kid is so far away from the church, and they don't listen to anything that I say anymore, and I, I don't even, they don't even text me back. I say, just leave your door open. That's it. So that when they return, and they will. Isn't that what the Bible says, that if you teach them in the ways of the Lord, that when they grow older, they will, they will what? They will not depart. That's a promise that we can hold on to. But often, our doors are so closed. So while our kids are away and, you know, our family is away, we're constantly judging them. We're trying to guilt them. We're trying to shame them. And that is so counter-gospel. The prodigal father, not just the prodigal son, but the prodigal father who lavished his son with so much mercy, he never was talking trash about his son. When his son came back, he wasn't like, oh, now you're going to show up. Walking through the streets all naked, embarrassing my good name. He never sends him any kind of passive-aggressive text. Oh, I didn't see you at church today. Is that how we're dressing now? The father leaves the door wide open. Watch this. He even does that for Lucifer. It's in the book of Job that we're told the sons of God are there communing with God. And guess who's there among them? Lucifer. The door was wide open. You can still return. You could still return. Now, many would say that he closed the door on himself at Calvary. But the point is, is that even up to the point of the cross, it's amazing that God's act of love was still offered 
to Satan. And, and if some of you are going to get upset with me on that, that's, that's, that's Colossians chapter 1, 19 and 20, through the death of Jesus, through the shedding of his blood, he reconciled everything, whether on earth or in heaven. Even one of our favorite leaders and authors says that it wasn't up until the cross that many of them, even in heaven, hadn't made up their mind until the cross. The point I'm simply making is leave the door open, and that's exactly what Jesus does. And Peter returns because the door was always open. Repentance means to turn back, and, and that's exactly what Peter does. He repents. He's at Jesus' feet now, listening to him. And then what Jesus does is he reinstates Peter. Do you love me? And Peter confessing his, his adoration, his love, his commitment. Yes, you know that I do. Then feed my sheep. So not only does he reinstate uh, Peter by letting the disciples know, no, no, I know, I know you didn't think he loved me at all, but I want to acknowledge I know he loves me. So don't, don't be hard on him, and I know that you love me. And then Jesus does, he not only accepts uh, 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 Peter's repentance and he reinstates him, but he also reemploys him, feed my sheep. I thought he would have get, been given his walking papers, right? <laughs> like, here's your pink slip. <laughs> don't let the door hit you on the way out. No, he reemploys him. I want you to re to feed my sheep. I want you to continue to, to make fishers. Uh, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I want you to continue to share the gospel of this kingdom. He reemploys him. Now, I want to just pause here for a little bit here because some of this story is lost in translation. Jesus is asking Peter if he loves him, and the way it reads in English is like how we understand love. Most of us don't know the difference of what kind of love we're referring to until we understand the context. So if I tell you I love Taco Bell, don't laugh. But if I tell you I love Taco Bell, you already know I'm not willing to die for Taco Bell. I ain't going to lose my life for it. Right? I'm not selling my birthright for it. Now, if I tell you I love my son, contextually, based on what you know of me, you know I'll lay down my life for him, right? If I tell you that I love my father, you'll say, oh, he looks up to his dad, so sweet. I wonder if his, his father taught him how to preach. <laughs> There's great admiration there, context. Right? If I tell you that I love Iris, you might go, oh, wait a second, this might be interesting here. Yes, but, well, hmm. It might throw you off maybe a little bit. There may be a story behind it. Ooh, say more, Pastor. This is now getting interesting. In the Greek, there are eight words to describe love. So you don't have to even think about the context. There's the one that most of us are familiar with that Hollywood loves to portray. It's the Disney type love. It's eros, it's passionate, it, it's desire. I saw you, I danced with you, now have me forever. Eros is a, a passionate love that can look like lust and uh, uh, it gets very intense. In fact, the Greeks look down on Eros because Eros kind of love could get you into all kinds of trouble. Now, people might have died for Eros type of love, but that's usually because someone maybe killed them in jealousy, right? It's not the sacrificing type of love. It's I'm into you right now. I mean, you really are drawing me. There's some kind of connection. But there's other types of love. There's the, the, the storge love. Storge is the family type love. See, again, talking about I love my brother. I, 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 love, I love my cousins, right? You would say, oh, yeah, that's family. They, they blood. They blood like that. And if someone said phileo, right, where, where we get uh, uh, Philadelphia, right, the city of love, brotherly love, uh, phileo is that brotherly type love, but it's, it's deeper than just brotherly love. It's, it's, it's intimate. It's, it's like a soul connection. It's the type of love that would have been experienced between John and David, right? Where they talk about their hearts being intertwined. Phileo love can be really, really deep. And then there's the erotopia love, 
which is more playful and flirtatious, which some of y'all always getting involved in. Sliding into people's DMs, doing all your little thirst trapping and everything like that. Uh, 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 my elder folks, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's not for you. Just let it go. Just let it. Thirst trap? What is he talking about? Right? And, and then there's the, the, the philautia love, which is very interesting. Philautia is a love that is self-love. Sometimes it can be interpreted as being selfish, but it's actually a love of, of, of self, meaning that you have good self-esteem. You care for yourself. It's really, when Jesus says to love others as you love yourself, is to have a healthy love and respect for yourself. And not many of us love ourselves in this way. But the Greek is so, so vast in how it describes love, you don't have to even worry about context because it's so clear by the word what it means. Now, the love that most of us are in tuned to and focus on and hear a lot of is agape. Agape, people believe, is the greatest demonstration of love. It is the highest level of love. It is the, it is, it is, it is the, 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 the heavenly love. It is God's love. And, and there's a reason why we arrive. Now, there are some theologians, some commentators uh, that will tell you that this doesn't really mean much of a difference at all. Phileo, agape, you can use them interchangeably. But I find it interesting that the texts that really describe the love of God always use agape. Almost always use agape. So for God so loved the world, it is for God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. When John says that God is love, he says God is agape. When Jesus says, uh, love one another as I have loved you, he uses again the word agape. When Paul describes, when Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians 13, he says love is patient. He says agape is patient. So all the main love texts in Scripture, when Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, Right? And then the second is to love your neighbor. He uses the word agape. So agape is like a strong love, and we have biblical evidence to see why Jesus uses this. So in the Greek, you want to know how this conversation goes down? In the Greek, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Simon Peter. Remember we talked about there's a significance why he calls him Simon, right? He even basically calls him by his last name, Simon, son of Jonah. Simon Peter. Do you agape me? Peter's response is, I phileo you. Did you hear that? See, it hits a little bit differently in Greek. Now, my Greek professor will tell me there's no difference. He always get on my case about this. Stop trying to read into it. It's no different. The author is just trying to just vary the words. But again, I'm just saying... If the Holy Spirit's inspiring this stuff, I have to admit, there has to be something there. I have to believe there has to be something there. So, do you agape me? He says, I phileo you. Oh, huh, interesting. Because you were sure sounding like agape the other day. Nah, man, come on, I phileo you. You know this. You know I phileo you. Simon Peter, he's asked a second time, do you agape me? He says, Lord, I phileo you. And you imagine the disciples looking at this? Oh, boy. Jesus not breaking eye contact. Jesus asks a third time. But this time, Jesus asks him, do you phileo me? Peter says, you know all things, and you know that I phileo you. Now, it may mean nothing, but if you just allow me to, I see it and feel it this way. I, I, I experience it this way. I see Jesus saying to him, Peter, do you love me to the point of death? that you would give your life for me, the way that you promised that you would die for me. Do you love me the way that I love you? Do you? No. I'm not there yet. But what I do have, I'll give to you. And right here, 
I meant phileo. Okay. Are you sure you don't agape me? Because, bro, you were so convinced of it, and these guys are looking to you for an example. You are going to be leading my church, and I need transparency. I need honesty. Be real with me. Are you sure you don't love me, love me like that? I'm risen, Peter. Look at me. I am God. You're telling me that seeing me now in the flesh, you don't love me with all of your heart? We really going to do this in front of everybody? You know that I love you. I'm just not there yet. So what you're telling me, Peter, is that you love me just this much right now. Yes, that's what I've been trying to say. I'm just not there yet. And we know this even we go to the book of Acts, even with the Holy Spirit coming over Peter, he still wasn't perfect. He was still a bigot. He was still racist. Oh, yeah, don't. I'm not, listen, I ain't trying to make it sound flowery. He was. Didn't even want to go into a Roman's house, a Roman centurion. Absolutely not. Jesus had to send him a scary dream with a bunch of beasts hanging out of a sheet and said, go now. Even Paul, like, blast him, you know, tweets. That's actually not Twitter anymore. It's something else. X, what is it called? Never mind. But basically blast Peter on social media like, uh, yeah, I saw you in the cafeteria only eating with the Jews. Acting like you didn't know any Gentiles up in there. Peter still had issues. He was still working through his stuff. But that doesn't stop God from calling us. Let me tell you something. Most of us, if a cross was waiting for you right outside these doors, you would renounce your Christianity. We're not honest with ourselves. We say I love you to people when we absolutely do not mean it. We only mean eros. We only mean storge. We only mean phileo, and we'll, 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 we'll give our vows, I love you, to the end of the earth and, and, and sickness and health. We, we really mean it. But we don't know what we're saying. Remember we learned last week when, it, when Peter was trying to give some advice to Jesus, hey, we'll build all these, we'll build these uh, uh, sanctuaries, three of them for you, Elijah and Moses. And then Luke says, Peter didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> he didn't even know what he was talking about, just talking. Many of us are on these different levels, but watch this. The call to discipleship is not the call to love people with arrows. The call to discipleship, the deep connection with God leads us to agape. And not just the people that we know and trust, but the people that God knows and calls us to love. Love them as I have loved you. You mean the homeless guy? Yes, that guy. But he's probably homeless because he made a lot of poor decisions. I'm not even going to give him a dollar. I don't even know what he's going to do with it. Love them as I have loved you. Well, I haven't really needed a lot of your love. I'm pretty good. Love them as I have loved you. The call to discipleship is to love and to love in a big way. Oh, but if I do that, that means I'm going to have to give up things. Yes. And it means I won't be able to do everything I want. Yes. It means you will deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. That's exactly what it means. But it won't always feel good. Absolutely. It will not always feel good. And this is exactly what Jesus says to him. After Peter says all those things, he tells Peter, follow me. I want you to follow me. And then... In verse 18, Jesus tells us the reason why agape love doesn't always feel good. In verse 18 of chapter 21, he says, Very truly I tell you, right? Verily, verily. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this, John writes, to indicate the kind of death 
by which Peter would glorify God. And then what did Jesus say to him? Follow me. He says, one day someone else will dress you, someone else will gird you, someone else will bind you, and they will take you to a place you do not want to go and will stretch you out. Simon Peter knew exactly what Jesus was referring to, and he was not happy about it. Because agape, agape, love, true love, I mean the, the definition of love in Scripture is not a feeling. The ultimate expression of love is not a feeling. However, listen, however, you can still feel it. It is not a feeling, but when love is enacted, when true love is enacted, people around you will be impacted by it. They will feel your love. It is not reliant on our feelings and our emotions. Eros is. Phileo can be. But agape is above that, and that's important that it's above it, because if, if, if agape wasn't above it, you and I would not have a savior. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus is asking his father, um, I know we invested a lot in this project. Is there another way? But not my will be done, not what I'm feeling, but what you want. Agape. Agape will have us giving up our will, giving up our desires, giving up what we think is best. Agape has us loving like God and watch this. I'm telling you right now, you will never be happier than when you are loving the way God has called you to love. You will never experience a greater, more lasting, fulfilling sense of love other than when you are completely trusting Jesus to be the author and the designer of love and to order your steps and to follow his directions wherever he tells you to go. This is so critically important here. Someone's going to take you to a place you do not want to go. But this is what Jesus is really saying to him. Watch this. He's saying, Simon Peter, I know you don't love me, love me like that, but one day, boy, you're going to love me, love me. <laughs> you're going to love me so much. And he didn't even want to hear it. What? Well, what about him? He points to John. What about him? How's he going to die? Jesus says, what's it to you if he's alive until I come in the clouds of glory? But you, Simon Peter, follow me. The very first words that Jesus ever shared with Peter, recorded in the Gospels, is follow me. He sees Peter, follow me. The last words recorded in Scripture from Jesus to Peter, follow me. It never changes Follow me. But, but John, was he trying, you're trying to say he's better than... No, no, Peter, keep your eyes on me. I'm not, I'm not ready to love you like that. You're not right now. But the way that I see you, Peter, I look at our relationship throughout the years, and I'm telling you, you're going to love me so much. Ooh, it's going to be so good. And sure enough, Christian history tells us that Simon Peter indeed was crucified. Jesus clearly describes crucifixion in this text. Christian history tells us that he was crucified, but it's very different. Christian history tells us that when they had sentenced him to death by crucifixion, Simon Peter, like he had done all throughout the ministry of Jesus, raises his hand. He has something to say. Yes, Peter, I only have one request. Please, crucify me upside down, for I am not worthy to die my Jesus. Think about that. Think about the symmetry of it all. Simon Peter, by the end of his life, 
understands completely what Jesus was always getting at. I want you to look like me, walk like me, talk like me. I want you to follow in my footsteps, and I'm going to teach you how to love. Follow me, Simon. Follow me, Simon. And you're probably saying, Pastor, why does he go to Simon? You keep telling us that there's something significant about it. We know that Peter means rock. We know that. But Simon means listener. Every time he called him by his birth name, he was essentially saying to Peter, Peter, I need you to be a good listener right now. My baby boy, I need you to be a good listener right now. Listen to me. Simon, Simon, listen. This is where Simon says comes from. Listen, 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 listen to me. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You don't love me, but I'm telling you, I know you. And by the end of your life, you will love me more than life itself. Jesus is calling us to have this beautiful symmetrical experience in our walk that when we look in the mirror we see Jesus when people look at us they see Jesus that someone will say how could you love this person that much how could you love them that much I don't love them that much because I feel it it was something that, 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 that I naturally felt. I love this much because I was taught how to love. The Bible says we only love because he first loved us. So Simon Peter, do you love me? No, I don't love you like that right now. But I hope to one day to love you, Jesus, the way that you love me, to love my neighbor, the way that you love me, to love my husband, my wife, the way that you love me, to love my children, the way that you love me, to love enemies, the way that you love me. The call to follow Jesus is the call to love. And we will see the beautiful symmetry from Calvary all the way here to Vallejo Drive. We started this series with the notion that in order to be a great leader, you must first be a good follower. And I'm telling you right now, I'd rather us be great followers than great leaders. Great leaders got big egos. Great followers are egoless, willing to be filled to follow Jesus. I just want to follow you, Jesus. If it, I don't need to wear a crown. I don't need a robe. I don't need the streets of gold. I need none of that. I just want to follow in your footsteps. If it means I'm carrying a cross, if it means I suffer greatly, as long as I'm following you, I will go wherever you tell me to go. Gird me up. Stretch me out. The only reason why we're here today is people who loved the way that Peter loved that followed his example and said, oh, that's what it means to follow Jesus. We are snowflake Christians. We'll stop coming to church because someone looked at us the wrong way. We'll stop coming to church because they didn't vote the way we wanted them to vote. But Jesus is calling us to something greater. And oh, what a wonderful church this will be. We love like Jesus. Do you want to be there? I want to make a simple call to discipleship, a simple call to follow Jesus. You see in your bulletins, we have two names, three names that are listed. I know these individuals because I've worked alongside two of them when I was at Pacific Union College. It's the first and the second reading of pastors Mark and Wendy and a pastor who is now a, a chaplain, Kelly, who want to join this church, this church. And I want someone to move to accept them into the loving family of Vallejo Drive. Has it been seconded? All in favor say welcome. Mark and Wendy. Are you agreeing to be a part 
of this discipleship program to be a follower of Jesus and to help lead others to Jesus. And Kelly, are you also agreeing to that? I know the work that you do at the hospital, but you decided to be a part of this family. Are you also wanting to follow Jesus and do as he asked? Is there anyone else here? Your name is not in the bulletin, but you want to be a part of this movement, a part of this church family. You want to love like Jesus, that when people walk into this sanctuary, they know they're among followers. Not just wannabes, not just people wanting to be the boss and leaders, but followers. I'm telling you, it's wonderful to have great leaders. I will take great followers any day. Is there someone else here that wants to make a stand? You simply want to say, I want to be that kind of follower of Jesus. I, I, I like him. I'm getting to know him. I, I love him, maybe not like that much, but I want to get to that agape. Right now, phileo. Right now, it's eros. I, I'm passionate. I'm excited. I, I get goosebumps when I hear good music and good preaching, but I'm not to the point where I love like Jesus. If that's where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray because we want to have a special, significant prayer for you this morning. We're closing out. We're closing out. I have decided to follow Jesus. Is there anyone? Anyone here? Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else? Praise the Lord. I see you back there, brother. Praise the Lord. You talked to me earlier today saying you wanted to be a part of this church. Praise the Lord. I see more. This is wonderful. This is no shame. Simon Peter said, yeah, yeah, man, I just phileo you right now. I'm keeping it real. I've walked with you. I've walked on water. And I'm telling you right now it's just phileo. One day it'll be agape. Is there anyone else? Anyone else willing to be open and transparent? I see you. I see you, my man. Zay, that's what I'm talking about. I love it. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? We're going to close out in prayer. I see you, Jared. I see you. Praise God. Anybody else? I see you. And Jared, we've, we got to study. We have to study. We had, Jared came to me a while ago and said, man, I'm ready for the studies. Anyone else before we close out in prayer? Anyone else? Anyone else? Again, I'm... Pastors Mark and Wendy, I'm so happy to have you a part of this church and moving forward with us. We're going to do great, even greater things because you're going to be a part of this church family and Kelly as well. But because they are licensed leaders, because, because they were trained in leadership, doesn't make them better than you. I'll take a great follower over a great leader any day. Anyone else as we close out in prayer? If there's anyone who wants to stand as we're praying, that is fine. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful challenge that you've given us. Thank you that your great love, that your great example continues to lead us to this day. We love because you first loved us. And so we are following. We are following you. We want to do as you have asked. And we will trust you every, every step of the way. Oh, Jesus, thank you for taking up your cross. And thank you for the cross that you trust upon our shoulders. The world's going to give us a cross no matter what, but your cross is far better. Because with your cross comes glory. With your cross comes resurrection. With your cross comes a reward. The world's cross, it just leads to death, and, there, and that's all. So, Father, we follow your son, Jesus. More than being a great leader, we want to be a great follower and learn to agape, learn to love the way that you love so the world can be transformed by your love and by your grace. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. amen.